to turn on your camera if you're not eating and you're well dressed. And please mute yourself unless it is only your turn to speak. And throughout this session, if you have any questions, please dig down notes so that you can actually submit it to our question master, uh, Sujata here, who is our, also our moderator, and she will actually uh, present your question during the Q&A session towards the back. Now, this session is recorded and the recorded recording will be provided later on only to the registered participants. Now, let us put our hands together and get yourself excited and welcome our organizing chair, Toastmaster Kishan, for his ad welcoming address. Kishan, the stage is yours. All right, thank you very much, Qbert. So good morning, everyone. And uh, as, as Greg had pointed out half an hour ago, yes, I'm in my Zoom attire today. Uh, uh, Well-dressed, uh, uh, waist up. Now, this today is really the first uh, official event of our annual conference. Now, I wanted to do things differently because we always say, annual conference, we'll do it over three days. We'll have education sessions. We'll have uh, the entire day. We'll have contests the entire day. And then on Sunday, we say goodbye. But then I was thinking to myself as a former attendee, well, education sessions, I know, I know we, uh, we like them, but then I feel like we can get a bigger audience if we do it online. And I saw this being validated when, uh, when Sujata and Rashmi had uh, beautifully executed that virtual summit two terms ago. And so I immediately became natural for me that why should we do education sessions in person and limit ourselves just to the people in the room? Let's do them online so that people have a takeaway from those sessions. And then let's go further by, uh, by having a live stream of our contests during the conference weekend. But at the same time, you might understand, ethnically speaking, I am a Gujarati Indian. For those who are not aware, Gujarati Indians are business people. So I need to, I need to make money, I need to turn a profit <laughs> somehow as well. And that's why we uh, decided, okay, let's uh, make this a hybrid event and we will, uh, we will actually, the, for those who actually purchase a ticket, either physical or a virtual ticket, you then be, will be able to not only participate live, but then re-watch those recordings at your convenience the next time. Because we all know that when you watch something the first time, you may see you will only recall what stood out at that point of time. But when you re-watch something again, that's when you gain new appreciation for it. And so, with this annual conference, I wanted to do things a bit differently. I wanted to do things in a way which I thought made sense, combining both the tradition of what we always do with some innovation about what we could do better. So with today's event, I, uh, it gives me great the pleasure that we have uh, such an esteemed speaker joining us who, as a matter of fact, was actually one of the speakers during our virt uh, virtual summit uh, take, uh, being handled by Division G. And with today's uh, event, I hope that you guys can see what we have in store for you for the annual conference. And you will join us for the remaining sessions, the education, as well as our contest. Because ladies and gentlemen, this will be the first time in three years, there'll be a physical contest. And I can promise you, you will not believe how much you miss the sound of hearing a joke, laughing, and then looking left and right and seeing the people laugh with you. And knowing that you have, knowing that you all share that moment that you all love that one joke. Uh, so come and join us either virtually or physically, and let's have a great annual conference. And with that, I hand over to my Toastmaster of the day, Q, but so over to you, Q. Wow, let's give a round of applause to our annual conference organizing chair, Kishan. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, hurry up and sign up now for attending the annual conference. I look forward to seeing you there physically. Now, next, for our international keynote speaker today, Gray Van Borsum undertook rigorous weight training and martial arts since 12 years old. That's right, since very young. And at the age of 16, 
he actually decided to take on two massive challenge to be the Australian national bodybuilding champion and also an Okinawan karate master. And along the way, he unraveled the warrior's code. So to, today, he is the world's youngest professional natural bodybuilder at the age of 20. That's right. And he is also an Okinawan karate master for over 40 years. And most importantly, he is an accredited speaker in Toastmasters. He was the first speaker in Australia and the Southern Hemisphere to be awarded this designation by Toastmasters International. Wow. Gray's ability to transfer his mindset into totally new areas of life and master them in relatively short time had him labelled by many as the master of remastery. Without further ado, let's put our hands to welcome Gray to show you the steps to master your mindset and remaster your life. Gray, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I want to ask you a question to start with, and it's something that I had to learn the hard way because as a kid, I was told I wouldn't amount to anything. What legacy do you want to leave? This is a really important question because most people don't put any thought into this. So what legacy do you want to leave? So when your time here is done and you've finished your journey, what do you want to be remembered for? And what change have you affected in the world and how have you bettered people and how have you bettered the planet? Take a moment to think about that because it's very important. You see, as a kid, I was told I would amount to zero. I was told I'd be a blight on society, that I would be nothing. And if you let those voices sink into your head, which so many of us do, especially in the time of the world we're in now, there's so much uncertainty. There's so many problems going on around the world outside of the pandemic. There's all kinds of conflicts. There's so much pressure that sometimes because of the isolation, we can really worry that we've got nowhere positive to go. And there's always something positive to do. There's always a way to better yourself and to increase and grow and do something worthwhile. And it can be so inconsequential to anybody else, but it can mean so much to you. So one thing I learned from inside this pandemic is the isolation was a big, big, big problem. So what happens when you're isolated? What happens when you're alone? You see, as a human species, we have a thing called Moore's Law, where we have 150 people we can actually have true relationships with. But when you're isolated and you're not allowed to touch people, you aren't allowed to be near people, you have to be separated for so long, it played havoc with our mindset. And the mindset we have can either be a, a terror or an absolute legend to you. And if it's a terror to you, it's going to pull you down. And there's an old saying I used to love, which is, it's very difficult to defeat an enemy who has outposts in your head. It can be an absolute terror. So what happens when we're in a negative space, a negative mindset, which so many of us are? I know I've been there, I know how it feels, and I know when you're losing traction and you feel like you're not making any progress in the world, how quickly you can descend into this abyss of darkness and you can feel like you're never going to come out of it. I have been there, so I know if any of you are going through this, that you can make it through this. I'm nothing special. I've done lots of stuff in my life, but I'm nothing special. I was a failed school kid who had a plan and a dream and I started to follow it. And I think you can do the same thing too. We aren't alone. No one's above anyone else. The one th great thing I learned from people when I was growing up is that everybody's the same. It just depends on how much drive you want to put into your life. For me, it was what I wanted to live and what I wanted to leave behind. And at the start of my life, I started trying to do it for the wrong reason. It was to prove to people that I had the worth and had, had what it took to make it. So everything was done from the wrong way. But when you get into a negative mind space, this is really tough because if you're not working on something that's bigger than you, things can crush you. So if you've got a plan and a dream and something you really wanted to work on and you've stopped, write down what it wants to be. Write down the goals. Write down something that you can start working towards again. And they only need to be baby steps. And don't overthink it. The trouble with most of us these days, especially the smart people, and one of my great things I tell people is that I'm not smart. The thing that I've got in my favour is naivety and stupidity. And when I say that, people think I'm joking, but I'm not. I say this honestly. I put so little thought into something I want to start. Because what happens when you're trying something new? You automatically ask yourself questions about why I can't do it. That's the first thing we ask ourselves. The first we tell ourselves is why we can't do it. And then we start working out all the reasons why we can't do it, then why we shouldn't do it, then why we shouldn't start. And then we don't start. 
And so many great careers, so many great people never reached the potential, never reached what they could have become because they talked themselves out of it. We can put the blame on family. We can put the blame on friends and naysayers. And I've had all that. I know exactly how that feels. But if you are willing to stop, if you're willing to talk yourself out of it, then you cannot put the blame on someone else. I can go back to Charlie Parker, the legendary saxophonist who had a cymbal thrown at his head when he performed badly one night. And he could have gone home. He could have stopped. He could have quit. But he came back and became one of the greatest ever. The same thing happened to me in bodybuilding. I was failing and failing and failing and failing. And I could have taken those fails and the laughter and all the things that happened to me as such a negativity, I could have walked away. But in my honest opinion, deep end learning is the key. If you're willing to take deep end learning into consideration, and I ask you to do this, if you have that little goal, that dream, that desire that you want to follow, apply deep end learning, which is this, just start. It's that simple. You will figure out the answers as you go. You will figure out solutions as you go. And the lessons are in the losses. You know, people don't realize with my life, they see the result. And I've won and done a lot of things. I really have. But none of that stuff actually matters because you know what? When you win something, that's a moment in your life. When you take control of something, that's a lifelong journey. You know, for me, winning Academy Awards or winning a world title is all wonderful at the time, but it comes and goes. And if you keep dwelling on that and living on that, going, wow, I was, I was the best, then you're a was. You have to keep pushing forward. You have to keep telling yourself there's more to do. And if you're in a negative headspace, it's time to change it. And I want to give you some steps to get through this because point one, there's no point in me saying, hey, it's going to be wonderful. Let's go for the gold when you're in a negative mind space and you don't believe you've got what it takes. Now, for anyone out there, there's some simple signs to find in someone who's having negativity. Their body posture is drooped. They become more isolated. They become very withdrawn. They start speaking very negatively. Their head's always lowered. If they're at work, they take extra sick days. They turn up late. All of these things compound and it makes you slip down into the darkness more and more. Now, if you're in this place, and I know someone out there is, there is always someone going through this stuff. And if it's not you, I guarantee someone knows someone who's going through this stuff. There's a reason we travel down this path. And it's usually a compounding set of circumstances. So we have to look at how we can change this and how we can make this better for ourselves. And one of the things I found is the problem we have today is we're spending so much of the time in the world that we've created for ourselves. We've missed the world that's created for us. You know, we're missing the outside and it's been clinically proven that if you get off your, sh your shoes and you walk on the grass, get into the, the bushland and breathe that natural air, that your body actually recalibrates and it, it gets itself grounded again and you start feeling better again. The human connection that we've lost in COVID, we have to start losing that fear of touching and connecting with people. Connecting via Zoom is something, but connecting face to face is better. And if you can go further than that and put your arms around someone, and hold them and give them a good hug, believe it or not, after one minute of that, it releases oxytocin and people feel much better. And if you're in a very negative space, exercise. Exercise is always the key. And it doesn't have to be going to the gym or anything vigorous. It can be simply going for a walk in the park or on the beach or with some friends. Because one half, half an hour essentially of exercise twice a day gives you 12 hours of better brain health per session. So if you exercise twice a day, you're in a much better headspace. Too many of us sit inside and we dwell. We spend our time on our phones. We spend our time doing all these things that release dopamine but don't actually help us. And what we're doing is we're putting our future in someone else's hands. You know, we're putting our future on, on what's happening, who likes us on our phone, all, all these responses coming in rather than how do we better ourselves. So if you're in that negative headspace, do very simple stuff. Just simply turn your phone off. Go for a walk outside. Find some music that inspires you and listen to it. If there's a speaker you like, listen to them. If there's something you like to watch, watch it. And set it up as a routine. You see, the human species is very homeostatic. We're very good with routine. And that's what we like. If we can put things into an actual routine, we will be so much better off. And that's something I do all the time because people always say to me, how do you keep the motivation? Well, I don't. I don't keep the motivation. None of us can keep the motivation, but I have passion through pragmatism. What I learned very young is that if I wanted to be something, I needed to have a pragmatic approach to what I wanted to be. 
You see a great deal of us, we love this thing, we get all wound up and a speaker talks and they go, wow, it's so good. And they go running out for 10 minutes. They go, what did they speak about again that made me feel so good? I can't remember. And next thing we've forgotten and next thing we start falling into that negative mind space again and next thing we're we're dwelling on the negative and the next thing we're going back to that same old way. We have to enforce change. We have to change how we do things and that's having a pragmatic approach. So to me, and I've got a case of one here, there's nothing in it because I can't stand them even though I have one, is your mobile phone, okay? Turn it off. Seriously, we have to disengage from these things every now and again. We are very creative people, we're very creative animals, but what happens when we don't get silence? The human brain is always on at the moment, it's never off. And to be creative and to think about our future and to plan things out, we need silence. And the trouble is now we've got all of these things interfering with us. We've got Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, email, SMS, different types of texting, WhatsApp, Zoom. We've got all these formats so we can't focus anymore. If you really want to change things and you really want to be something, turn your phone off and start planning out your future. And the way to do that is by keeping a very simple journal. It's something I've done for years and it's something that I can tell you and I promise you it works. Whether you like lines or no lines, whatever you like your journal to be, Buy a journal, simple pen and paper that you like. I pay money for nice pens because I believe, and old speaker Jim Ron said this, he said, why, you, why would you put a million dollar idea in a five dollar journal? So I spend money on specific things and I truly believe there's a link between the head, the pen and the paper. I don't think you can type in the ideas and I've been a writer in movies for 20 years. I, I don't think that works the same. I believe there's an absolute link between your mind and your pen as you write. And what you have to do is this. When you start planning to change yourself, there's all these theories that for 21 days or for 28 days, I don't believe that. I believe when you start planning things, you do it until. So what you do in your journal, you write one paragraph, a single paragraph about what I am. Not what I'm going to be, what I am. You see yourself in the future for what you can be. So when I wanted to win the World Shooting Championships, I started writing in my journal in 2011. Now, if you've done the math on that, I won it in 2014. And I can show you, I've got them inside. Anyone ever wants to see them, I have three and a half years of the same paragraph being written. I am the world shooting champion. I win because when I walk to the line, nobody can beat me. I've out-trained, out-worked, and out-thought everybody. There is no competition against me on the day because no one worked as hard as I did. That is why I am the world shooting champion. I wrote that every single day. When I walked out into that range in America, there was no pressure, there was no competition. I just went out and won because that was my chance to show them how good I'd become. We have to change our mindset for the future. If you keep telling yourself you want to be this, you're going to be this, you're always thinking like it's up there somewhere, you haven't reached it. You have to change your mindset into where you are. So you have to think as if you've achieved it and then everything will change accordingly. That's how it works and it's really simple. Now here's the clincher. There's no golden ticket. Everybody I've ever spoken to wants the quick fix, the quick result, the quick answer. There is no such thing. The challenges of my life have been vast. People look at the things. They've seen the national champion in bodybuilding. They've seen the world champions in in shooting. I've I've got multiple titles in in shooting and bodybuilding. We've got seven Academy Awards. I've got the accredited speaker. I've got, there's heaps. I can't even keep up with it all. But you know what? It's taken years. I think about my movie career and people see what I've done. They see the Oscars, they see that stuff. They don't see the 15 years of failure. They don't see that all the times for three years in Australia, I got told no, that I didn't have what it took. I wasn't skilled enough. I would never get there. I was too big. I wasn't talented. I didn't have the right look. I could go on forever with the lists. But if you take no, then it's gonna be no. Always do the the thing that I do, which is find another way. So find some other result, one a way you can make it change. So what I did is what my dad did. When my dad was, I was a kid, my dad showed me a story of his life. He was a world champion kayaker. He couldn't swim, he had no money, he had nothing. So his family couldn't afford to buy him a kayak. So at age 14, he quit school in order to become a boat builder to build his own kayaks so he could start paddling and take on the championships. He made the Olympic team, but guess what? New Zealand couldn't afford to go to the Olympics because you had to pay your own way. So he couldn't afford to go. So what did he do? They kept thinking, how else do I make something happen? How else do I achieve? So the record had just been set for crossing Cook Strait between the North and South Islands of New Zealand. And that's what he set out for. The record at the time was five hours, 14 minutes. Early January, 1963, 
he set out on that paddle. He went through the roughest terrain. If you've ever seen Cook Strait, it can be like Bass Strait. It's horrendous. But he made that crossing in a time of three hours, 40 minutes. And it's a record that next year will have been 60 years. It's unbroken. So this is made by a guy that built his own boat, his own paddles. He couldn't swim and had no money. So what's attainable for you? What's stopping you? That's what gets me. Everyone goes, I can't do it. I can't do it. You can do it. We just don't believe we can do it. So the first thing we have to change is our mindset. And the first way to do that is to start keeping a journal. It's simple. It costs about $3. Buy a journal. If you've got no money, you get a cheap big pen. Get started. People put so much emphasis into this first step. The first step is just a step. And that's when the deep end learning comes in. Stop questioning and start moving. The action takes over. If you start putting in the action, things will start happening. And if you're making a wrong turn, it doesn't matter. You will recalibrate and you'll move back in the right direction. It's like when someone throws you in the pool and you can't swim. But guess what? You'll start drowning. But I guarantee you very quickly, you'll work out a way to get to the surface. And you'll build up the skill set to start swimming. And you'll get to the other end. But if you don't have the mindset to do that, you will fail yourself. And you don't want to be that person. So you've got to go back to the person you dreamed of being. You see, I don't believe in childhood dreams. I believe we have dreams and I believe they're for a purpose. So everything I ever dreamed I wanted to be as a child, when people told me I could be nothing, I decided that I wasn't going to become one thing, I was going to become everything. That was the whole thing for my life and there's still more to do. There's so many more things I want to do. But that's what makes life so good. We all get dwelling on this thing now, that, oh, I'm 40, I can't do it, I'm nearly 52. You know what, midlife now, we keep forgetting it's 40 years. So we leave school, we do all this stuff in our 20s and our early 30s and then we stop. We go, I'm 40 now, I've got to do it. So no, you don't have to. When you're 40, you have another 40 years to go at least before you're completely old and get more decrepit and things start going wrong. You've got a lot more that you can do. So what can you do? And this is something I learned when I severed my tendons off my leg. I was doing a big stunt on a project and I got hit by a car on the wrong angle and I snapped my kneecap in half. I, I severed the tendons off my leg and I had to get it all screwed back together, which they're all still in my knee and it gives me ungodly pain. But instead of lying there, and I couldn't walk for nearly a year, instead of lying on the lounge at home or in the bed going, oh, I can't do anything anymore. I can't do this. I couldn't do that. I used to do this. Stop that thinking. Think of this. What can you still do? What are you able to still do and do it? Stop thinking about what you can't do. You can't do it, so stop worrying about it. Put your headspace into the new thing you can do. And if it's writing, a story, your life story, a book, a song, whatever you're into, then that's the path you take until you can do that again. And you may never do that again. So then you take the learning you've taken from that and you apply it to the next thing. This is what people need to change in their mindsets. To me, it's a very simple thing. It's so simple that it makes it difficult. It's no different with people on the stock market. Everyone plays the stock market when if they just put their money in a good blue chip stock and left it for about 20 years, they'd make more money. It's simple, but we want to play the market. We want to make it more difficult. We shouldn't. Make life simple. But you do that by putting the work into what you want to be. Don't make your life a challenge because you hate your life or you hate what you do. And if you do dislike what you do, and you do what I did. I hated carpentry, I hated building, but that was, that was my only qualification to this date. It is my only qualification. But I, I hated it so much, I used to sit outside the building site for 30 to 40 minutes to psych myself up enough to walk in there and not be suicidal. That's how much it would eat me away because I knew I was destined for other things. So what are you doing? Are you one of these people that sits outside the workplace and, and sits there unhappy all day and, and wishes they could be doing something else or wishes life could take them down a different path or, or wishes for more? Stop wishing for more. It's not easy. It takes a long time. I've been doing martial arts for over 40 years now. I still don't know half of it. It took me 15 years to get into movies, 15 years of failure. 15 years of going to Hong Kong and starting to get my foothold in there, getting to know all the big film stars in Hong Kong, and then it all fell apart. So I had to come back home and go back into building and start again. And that was my dad's thinking kicked in. Well, that didn't work. So I know that doesn't work. Okay, how else can I do it? So I started thinking about the other ways I could do things. So I started making short films. I started writing films. Now I had very little money. So whatever money I had, I put towards a cheap computer, a cheap camera, so I could get started and start learning the skills. It was a 15 year journey of failure. There was no guarantee of money, no guarantee of success, no guarantee I'd make anything out of it. But if you think of things in a linear time frame, you'll never start. Because who wants to put 15 years into something and have a fail? But you know what? Once you're in the journey and you're on the way, 
You don't think about the time frame. You're on the way. And you're already happier because you're on the way. And that's not to say that you're not going to get blindsided by life. The things aren't going to come out and absolutely floor you because they will. But you are on the path and you will find your way back to your feet. Sometimes it's quick. Sometimes it takes time. I've been both paths. I've been completely knocked down and bounced back up the next day. And I got hit really hard once and it took me a year and a half to come back. And I didn't know if I would, but I kept fighting forward. And guess what? Eventually it changed. Too many people give up too fast. We have so much inside ourselves that we don't tap into. We need to start looking for the other side. One thing I do with myself a lot is I try and push myself beyond that comfort zone. You know, we, I've heard people talk about it with runners hitting the runner's wall. I found mine through fighting. Doing my martial art gradings for my thirds and fourth and fifth degree black belts where you're fighting 30 and 40 and 50 people, full contact, and I'm jumping rope between every fight and you're exhausted. You've been hit so many times that most of the time when people would finish our fifth down or fourth down black belt gradings, they would be taken to hospital and one of, as a, to get checked out. And one of my friends who passed his grading was taken to hospital and they thought he'd been in a head-on car crash. That's how hard it was. But when you reach the other side, there's so few people there. And I tell you, you learn something about yourself you never knew. I've seen people sit down and quit halfway. And I've seen the smallest, lightest, skinniest people find the other side of themselves. And this whole new person's born. And it's one of the most amazing experiences you ever get to witness. And if it's you, then there's something to push yourself for. There's something to drive for. You just have to find out what ticks in here. And that's the question I ask most people when I meet them, believe it or not. I'll meet someone out of the blue and I'll say to them, so what's your life passion? If you could do anything, what would you do? And people automatically think about work. And I go, no, 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 anything. Don't think about work because you can make your passion your work. <laughs> that's a separate thing. Follow your heart, follow what drives you and learn the skill sets to do that. And as a kid, I didn't understand how this actually worked, but this is how it works. Your brain in its own special way starts building a super highway for information. So if you immerse yourself into something and you think about only that, you surround yourself with pictures on the wall of that thing you love. If you read books of things you love, that's the same thing you keep immersing yourself into the same area, very quickly you'll become a subject matter expert. But what happens, your brain actually redirects a lot of its parts into that section and it passes information faster and faster and faster. So your learning curve goes like this. And very quickly you improve out of sight. We've all seen that in people where they're like this and they, woof, they suddenly go up. People say, wow, how did that happen? It's because it's clicked over to the next part. And that's important. So if you want to be something, you've got to start putting steps in place to be something. Because there's four things. If you're, if you're suffering, okay, you have to find survival. You have to learn to survive. And once you go through survival and you build that, you start building stability. And once you build your stability, you start moving into security. And then you can move to success. It's the four S's and it's the fifth one, it's simple. It just takes time and it takes character building and it takes you to have a pragmatic approach to want to build yourself up. You know, if people saw my film career and saw how many times I failed, they would have never got me to start. My bodybuilding career was no different. I didn't win on stage for three years. People used to laugh at me. People used to spread rumors about me. But guess what? You've got to turn negativity into fuel. Because there's the old saying, this, but by the time you reach 16 years of age, you've been told no about 17,000 times. And so it takes a lot for someone to change the no to a yes. But if you start doing it for yourself, you start building up what we call rhino skin. You start building that armor around you. If someone tells you no, not only let it bounce off, take it in and turn it into fuel. And that gives you the power. That gives you more energy. So if someone tells me I can't do it, you best believe I'm getting there. I became the first accredited speaker in the Southern Hemisphere, not because anyone else couldn't have done it. It was because I was told that no one had ever done it. I probably couldn't either. I don't know who did it the fastest, but I did it in four and a half years. I got my accredited speaker, my accredited speaker, my ACB, my advanced communicator bronze in two weeks because you needed that to do it. I hadn't even started on it. So I rang every club in New South Wales and I traveled to every club that would have me and I did every single speech out of those books. In two weeks, I had my ACB. That allowed me to go for my, my award. I failed the first year, the video wasn't good enough. The second year in Chicago, we had a life incident happen. I had to change my speech on stage. So the speech, if you've ever seen my 2018 speech, I made that up as I was walking out using the same three words of the title. One of the scariest moments in my life, but I still did it and I failed. 
and I failed in front of thousands of people and all the people in Australia that were watching online that had all supported me all the way through. You know how that feels? Driving all the way home from the airport after being in Chicago, paying my own way to get to the USA, to drive home and everybody going, so how did you go? That's the most awesome question when you failed. How did you go? Yeah, fantastic, I didn't get it, great. You know? So the whole way back to my house, I was thinking, I'm never going back. Why should I have people judge me? I don't need this. And that replayed in my head all the way back until I turned the last corner to our street. And it clicked over and I went, you know what? I'm going back. So I got straight on the phone. I rang Toastmasters International. I said, book me in, I'm back next year. And I made a point with myself that I would be good enough, strong enough, and have the purpose to deliver a speech that would be powerful enough without, I don't believe an accredited speaker should use lots of slides. I think you should be able to speak and you should be able to command an audience and you should be able to give people something that they take with them that's going to change their lives. And so when I spoke on mental health and suicide prevention, there was a reason for that. And regardless of getting the accredited speaker's nod or not, it didn't matter because I'd helped people in the audience and it really did. And that was worth the trip on its own. But I was lucky enough to get it and it was fantastic and it was a great honor. But it's just another stepping stone that's done now, so what's next? So what you do to make yourself better is this. If you've got a skill set in any field, Take it and break it down. This is where journaling comes in handy because especially when life's building up on you and life's getting all around you and you, you, you get pushed down under the pressure of life, you stop working out the answers because the pressure's so great you can't see the light anymore. But if you write it down, you can break it down. And so you get your journal and you write down all your problems, all the things you want to do and do it in sequential order from one to 10 or one to 20 or however many there are, it could be 50. And you take them on from the most important one down. And step by step, you look for the answer. Don't dwell on the problem. Everyone can bring me a problem. Find your solutions. Start searching for your solutions. They will come to you if you turn that off and start finding your solutions. The achievements I've made in my life have happened because I've turned phones off, because I've been dedicated enough to go, you know what? I sit on the edge of the bed every morning, and every morning I have the same argument with myself. You've got that voice on one shoulder saying, don't bother, it's not worth it, go back to bed. And this one who goes, don't listen to that, get up. And regardless if you think you're gonna make it or not, you get up regardless. It's passion through pragmatism. Your approach has to be pragmatic. You have to put the steps in place and be diligent with yourself. If you get up and you lean over and you turn the alarm off, then put it on the other side of the room. Do that, get up, start getting up. Don't wait for the whole alarm to ring and the whole song to play. As soon as it starts on your feet, up, and you make progress and you start. Whether you can see a finish line or not, you get started because that's how you do it. Stop listening to the outside world because it will influence you in a bad way. On top of that, I want you to do this for me. Write a list of your five closest friends. Write a list of your closest family. Write a list of your closest work colleagues. Once you've done that, do this. What positive influences do they bring to your life? What negative influences do they bring to your life? And list those down. Once you start breaking these things down, it becomes very clear the people you may not want to spend as much time with and the people you want to spend more time with. What are the people who inspire you? Who are the people you'd like to to be, the lives you'd like to live, and jot those down. And you start moving your way towards that. If you have friends that are positive, spend more time with them. And these aren't people that are necessarily going in your direction, as far as the same career path, but they're going in the same direction, which is that way. Go up, find friends that are positively reinforcing things, find friends that will hold you accountable for what you do, because they're the friends you want. I have a really dear friend of mine who has been an ultra achiever his entire life, and we have pushed each other since we were kids. An amazing character. He's just been battling one of the rarest forms of cancer in the world. And I've never seen someone smile the whole way through chemotherapy. Who, when he finished his chemo, he got up and they said, right, you've got to be in hospital for another two weeks. He goes, why? I feel great. I'm going home. I'll call you when I get there. Who now has found out he has another level of cancer that's kicked in. They're found and he's back in there and he's still smiling. And I know that if anyone can beat this, it's him. The mindset this guy has is incredible. He's trained himself through all his years of failure to come back and to fight back and to win. You see, there's going to be times in your life when life pushes you to the edge. But when it does that, have a look over the edge, appreciate the view and get back in the game. Because we're all capable of coming back. Even if you don't believe in yourself at the time, come back. 
Because as you start stepping back towards the goal, the belief will kick in. And if it doesn't kick in, find a friend who believes in you until your belief kicks in. That is so important. These are basic steps to do this, but really, it's so simple. There is no magic ticket. There's no magic cure. There's no avoiding steps. You have to go through this process of learning through the hard times and learning from people that have been there because that can shave down the hard times. Find someone who's great at what they do and follow what they do. There's so many ways to do this stuff, but really it comes back to this, changing your mindset. So look at the things you've got going for you. Look at the things you don't have going for you and then throw that list away. Focus on the stuff you do and start building up on that. Apply that to what you love to do, your career, your life, your family, all of the goals you have and start building towards that. These are so important to do. So if you can start doing that, that'll give you some really good basic steps to move forward with. And just remember, it's going to take time. It will take lots of time. I'm still working towards my speaker's goals. I'm nowhere near where I want to be yet. Most of us aren't. We come to Toastmasters because of what it gives us, but also for what we can give back. And everyone is learning from each other. No one knows at all. There's no mastery in martial arts. I disagree with being a martial arts master. I don't think that exists. We're always learning. There is only growth. And if you're not growing, you're dying. There is no third direction. So make sure you're always trying to grow. You see, for me in my life, I've taken influence from so many people. I started to speak because of my mum. Most people don't realise I was incapable of speaking for myself. I was the youngest kid in my street by five years. I used to get bullied, bashed, picked on nonstop. I had incredibly dry skin. My feet and hands were split open and bleed all the time. My childhood was horrendous. I started acting out at school. I started getting in trouble at school. It went from bad to worse. It was so bad that the local community, the kids used to gang up on me. And these kids were much older. They used to beat me up all the time. So I started going to a different road and jumping down this big seven meter drop cliff, hanging onto a tree and sliding to avoid it. But this stuff weighs up on you. And if you don't start addressing these problems, you have to start changing. Because if you don't, they're gonna eat you away. And the greatest lesson I learned from all of that and from the beatings I used to get was that one day when I decided to change. I listened to my grandmother. My grandmother was an amazing woman. She was in, back in 1921 flying in biplanes with Hudson Fish who started Qantas. And she was one of those game ladies that took the chance to go up on these planes which could have crashed at any tick of the clock. And she said to me, you have the potential to fly. You just have to believe you can. And so I decided to change my life. My mum had agoraphobia. She'd come from a very violent background that had constant beatings and all of her brothers and sisters end up becoming alcoholics and had anxieties, depression, suicides, all of that stuff happened in her family. And that was getting transferred into us. Till my mother joined Toastmistress and changed herself and then changed our lives. My father, who took himself from being a failed school kid to being a world champion. My karate master, who I've learned so much from. My friends that are experts in the field of photography people who try, try so hard to become so much, they're always working for a better solution. It rubs off on you. So if you've got influences in your life, listen to them, take them on board, because I guarantee at the same time you are an influence on their life. So give them as much of you as you can. And together you will form an alliance and then from there you will build something even greater. I've learned so many things in my journey in my life that I can look back honestly and now I'm in a position where I feel I can pass things on to people. And it's not difficult, it's just that we have to look inside ourselves honestly and most people don't want to do that because they're scared of what they'll find. So I want to give you some steps, some basic steps of things to do. So number one is of course take control of your thoughts. It sounds easy but it's really difficult. But you do that by keeping a journal. So please start journaling. If you start journaling you will actually make significant changes and it will change your mindset and it will never go back. And whenever you get a new goal, you, once you've completed that first one, you transition that whole thought process and that whole paragraph into that next thing. But make sure you do that one paragraph because I will tell you honestly now, I'm not going to fluff around. If you don't have the tenacity inside you and the diligence inside you to write that one paragraph, then how the hell are you ever going to put the work in to become the thing you want to be? Get up in the morning, sit on the edge of the bed, make a pact with yourself you're going to start no matter what mindset you're in, get up and start moving. Write in your journal what you are as if you're already there and get to work on it. Be prepared to make the mistakes, keep moving forward. Be prepared to be told you'll never get there and keep moving forward. Turn that stuff into fuel and move forward faster. That's one of the simple keys. Have a clear vision. Don't say, oh, I think I'd like to be a a speaker? 
No. What kind of speaker? Are you, a, are you an inspirational speaker? Are you an educational speaker? Are you, doing, are you a mental health speaker? What do you want to be? And then what level do you want to be at? Do you want to be accredited? Do you want to be the world champion of public speaking and Toastmasters? Do you want to go through and become a full keynote speaker? What do you want to be and hone in on it? You can't have these bland, broad stroke goals. They do not work. You have to, to hone in on the middle and absolutely focus in that. That is the key. Focus on that and keep working towards that stuff. Okay, the journal is important, but the midlife thing is even more important. Stop telling yourself you're old. I don't know how old you are out there. I'm 50, nearly 52. I have a long way to go. I didn't shut myself off at 20. I changed my life career in my 40s. When we were doing the films, we did really well out of Mad Max Fury Road. We did great with Happy Feet 1 and 2, that stuff. But guess what? Most people don't realize in the end of, Happy, sorry, end of Mad Max Fury Road, we were shut down by the studio. We would owed money. We were, we were told we'd never work again. We were going to lose our homes. It was a year and a half of nothing. But I had to go back and work as a laborer because we had no possible income. I had to keep the family afloat and keep the house. They're really hard times. That's a big slap in the face when you've been at the top of the tree. Working with A-list Hollywood actors to suddenly be working as a laborer at the bottom of a lift shaft in knee deep mud with a shovel just scraping mud. Those things mentally hit you and life will blindside you. So you've got to prepare yourself for that stuff. But also knowing that you will come back and your midlife is 40 years. You have a lot of time to work towards something. That doesn't mean put it off. That doesn't mean hold back. That means work towards it. You have the time. And be prepared if you're 50 to change your life. We've heard the story of Colonel Sanders who started in his 60s. I've no, I know the stories of people who have completely changed their life in their 70s. You're not too old to do anything. If you have a dream and you have a passion and you want to be something, start working towards it and start today. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Say, oh, tomorrow, tomorrow's not always another day. There's a lot of people that were here today that are going to be dead tomorrow. Don't put things off. Make a start. If you have something to write, put the pen to paper and start writing. But get your idea down, get your thought down and then physically start to act. And the more you start tying these things together, the faster you will move forward and you'll make great progress and you'll start having a career you never dreamed you could have. Because you have to remember, everything I'm known for now as an adult were my greatest fears as a child. I'm known for my martial arts ability. I'm known for my speaking ability. I'm known for my strength ability through bodybuilding. I'm known for my filmmaking ability. I had none of those skills. I was a skinny kid who flunked out of school with dry skin and split heels, who just wanted to be more, who got sick of people telling him he couldn't be something, who decided to come back. And that whole revenge thing of, I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove to you what I got, took me right through to the nationals. When my friend's family laughed at me at age 12, when I wanted to be a bodybuilder, I went away from their house. I never went back to their house until I'd won the nationals seven years later. And I walked up to their door with a trophy and put it there. It was an absolute thing of revenge. But what it taught me was the mindset that I needed to have in order to win, in order to change. And that's what I took from it. The trophy didn't matter. I gave that to them. I kept the nameplate, but I gave the trophy to them. But that changed my life, the thinking process. But in 2016, I learned a bigger lesson. I was summiting or training to summit Mount Everest. So a friend of mine came up to me and he said, hey, gee, ever feel like giving Everest a shot? No, I'd never climbed a mountain in my life. Hadn't even thought of it, but I thought, what the hell? I didn't have a goal at the time. I thought if we're gonna do one mountain, let's do the big one. So we started training. And the training was amazing. We were doing 10 hours a day, altitude chambers at five and a half thousand meters, 30 kilo backpacks up and down the hills at night, lunges, the climbing walls, running machines, rowing machines for hours and hours a day. And I loved the training. But as the climb became closer and the summit team started to hone itself up, I thought I needed to do more. So January 2016, on the 24th of January, I pushed the boundaries. I'd done my five hours in the chamber. I'd worked really hard. Outside, it was a 40 degrees Celsius day. I threw on a 30 kilo backpack and I headed up into the hills for another four hours of trekking. We have lots of stairs here. About an hour into the journey, I realized I'd left all my water at home. But being a typical stupid male, I kept going and I kept pushing on and I finished the rest of the climb. I got back to my house and it was going to be the first martial arts session of the year. And our lawn was really long, so I thought I'll start mowing and I mowed the entire lawn. Now we have a 2000 square meter block of land. That's a three hour mow. I was so dehydrated, I never thought about it, but I walked inside, I got into the hot water of the shower and bang, it felt like a sledgehammer had hit me across the head. I clung to the walls and I knew something was really wrong and I'd suffered a major stroke and I nearly died. But during my time 
in the stroke ward at Royal North Shore Hospital, some very important things happened. All of those victories I'd had in my life faded away. Not one of them came into my headspace because they meant nothing. What mattered to me was that I got well for my wife, my kids, my friends, and the people I wanted to help. And it changed the way I do everything. When I achieve now, it's to show the kids in my school that you can be something. When I push a new level, I show the people around me that they too can push a new level. Whatever I try and do now is to show other people that they too can achieve. When I did the accredited speaker, it wasn't for me. It was to show the other Australians that we weren't isolated. We, it's just because we're this little place at the bottom of the world didn't mean we couldn't achieve too. I hope we have a lot more come through one day. I hope we get another world champion one day. Public speaking, we've had one. I'd love to see another one. I'd love for you in Malaysia to get your own world champions, all your own people moving into accreditation, doing all of that stuff. And whatever your dream is, follow it, chase it, become it. Because so many people forgive it and forget it and walk away from it. But I tell you now, my first job out of, <laughs> out of school was two weeks in a nursing home. And I learned from some very old people that the regrets of life are huge when you don't fulfill them. And all they could ever tell me was, gee, I wish I'd tried this. Gee, I wish I'd tried that. So do yourself a favor, work towards your goals. Work towards changing your mindset. Become the person that I know you can be. Become the person who's absolutely goal-driven and I know that if you actually do this, you can make the world, your family, and everyone around you better and make the world a better place. I hope that works for you. So thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Gray. Let's give him a round of applause for such a wonderful session on changing your mindset. Thank you, Gray. And I'm really excited to have learned so much from you. Next, I would like to invite our question master, Postmaster Sujata to handle the Q&A session. Over to you, Sujata. Thank you, Cubert. Wow, Greg. I changed my screen mode to just looking at you and I felt that you were just speaking one-on-one -on -one to me. And whatever you said actually resonated with me. Truly, it's just a, you know, an impact that you had on me. Thank you so much for that, for that sharing. Now, we have a few questions from our audience today and even our role players. Uh, this comes from Kelly, uh, Kelly Ketty. She says, um, it's a question that something you mentioned about your grandma told you. Can you tell us what your grandma told you about you have the potential to fly and she would like to actually use that coat? So my, my grandma was known out here as the pioneer granny. So back in 1921, in a farming paddock in the back of Queensland, right in the outback, uh, Hudson Fish, way before he started Qantas, was looking for anyone to invest in his dream. And he brought this little rickety biplane to the outback and 200 townspeople, very important townspeople, gathered in this area to hear this man speak. And all he said was, who will fly with me? Who is prepared to fly with me? And it was going to cost three weeks pay. And that's a lot of money in the Depression back in 1921. No, no one had money. And after he tried saying this three or four times, no one did it. And he said, you know what? Has no one here the courage to fly? And then my grandmother, who was 19 at the time, put her hand up. She goes, I'll do it. And she gave him literally all the money she had. And she jumped in the rear cockpit of the plane, put the goggles and the cap on her head. And they had to clear the paddock out of sheep and cows. And this rickety biplane bounced along the field and took off into the air at 62 miles an hour. And what she said to me, because I was around at her place one day when I was being so bad at school, my parents sent me up there for the weekend. And we used to eat rice pudding and we'd sit around the table and talk. And she told me this story and she goes, you know, I just, I believe that when I got up there and I looked down and I saw all these people who were so important when I was on the ground, who just looked like ants. She goes, I realize a lot in life's about changing your perspective. And when I was up there, I felt important. I felt like I could do anything. And she goes, I knew at that point and that moment that I would one day travel the rest of the world by air. And at age 65, she did. Qantas gave her a free first class open ticket for life and she traveled the rest of the world by air. But her money went towards him buying his second Avro biplane and starting the airline we call Qantas. So they used to put her in all the magazines and she said to me, I believe you have the power to fly. She goes, it depends on how you look at yourself. She said, if you have the tenacity, if you have the courage to look inside yourself and see the person I believe you can be, she goes, you can become much more than you ever dreamed. And she said, now go and do it. And so I chose to change my thinking and 
all of these people around me, like my grandmother, my mum and dad, all those people that had these small nuggets of information and, and they had so much juice in the story. It all inspired me to believe that I could be more. And I think one of the really important things, and this isn't in what I was saying today, but if you have kids and if you have a family story that you understand and know, everyone in people's families have achieved and done things. Tell your kids and tell your grandkids about them because when your kids and your grandkids feel like they come from something, they believe they can be more than if they didn't. So if you tell them those stories, two things. One is that the stories don't get lost forever. And two, the kids aspire to higher things. And if you can change your children to believe they can be greater than they ever thought they could be, then you're an absolute winner. Thank you, Greg. That brings me to a question. When you say, you know, um, tell your kids their story, you know, your family story and so on. What if, you know, someone do not have a, a good family story? And I am always conflicted between... You see, I give my children advice as in, you know, if you can't find what you're passionate about, do what you're good at. And just last night, my daughter was actually uh, crying on this saying that, you know, um, I'm, I, I, I don't really know what I'm passionate about, but I know I can speak and that's why I'm doing law, but I don't enjoy it. You know, and how do you go about this kind of situation? I got to know a really well-known priest in America a number of years ago, and he said something so simple, but it was so perfect. He said, work towards what you're good at. He said, it mightn't be the thing, but it might just be the thing that leads you to the thing. <laughs> and it was so simple, but it was so honest. Because I, you, you'll start, people say I started off wanting to, I started off wanting to act in movies. And from that, it failed and failed and failed. And then when I got to know George Miller, George said to me, Greg, I think you've got a great eye for film. He said, you shouldn't be acting, you should be directing. And I'd never thought of that. And he said, but he said, I'll tell you how it works. And he said, let us put it into perspective. He said, you're the actor, I'm the director. And he goes, no, you're not right for the role. Thank you. He said, what side of the table do you want to be sitting on when that gets said? <laughs> and it became very apparent to me that that mattered. So, but he, he looked for it and he said, I think you have an eye. And I'd never thought about being a director at the start. I didn't think I had the goods. But then he said, no, no, I've watched the way you shoot your short films. You have an amazing eye for this. So think about it. And that's when we eventually started directing. And so it's, it'll, if you go into a realm that you actually have a skill set in, she may just find the niche that works for her. And that's how it works in the journey. You, you never go straight into the thing. I, I worry about all these kids that leave school with so much pressure on them to become this thing. And it's not what they want to be. Because no one, I, I can ask any one of you in your 18, 19, 20 years of age, did you really know what you wanted to be? Most people haven't got a clue. I know it took me years to really work out my niche. And what it's been now, my niche is this, that all the skill sets I've become really good at was because I tried it. And I believe in trying things to the top. Like my dad said to me, don't, don't stop halfway. If you start it, you finish it. And at the end, you can analyze it. So when you try it, take it as far as you can ever possibly take. If you want to be a basketball and you're five foot six and it's going to be a struggle, take it as far as you can take it. And when you've exhausted all options and you realize it isn't for you, take all those skill sets you learned from that and apply it to the next thing. And it'll shave years because the foundations of everything are the same. And if you've worked hard to build a foundation in something, you can transfer that to the next thing. And that's what I've done with my life. I've, I've shaved years off everything. If you look at my life journey, everything I've done has been condensed as it's gone forward because I've taken more and more skill sets and applied it to that, gone, oh, well, I've shaved this. Oh, I know how to make that work fast now and I can do that. So when you're talking about your kids and having people to, and even careers that they're not quite sure of, tell them to start on it and give 100% to it. And out of that, they might find their goal. They might find that little niche that works. And if you don't have a family story, and here's the clincher, people never think their stories are big enough. I'm, I have... I'm fortunate I found some decent stories in my family. There's plenty of them that aren't, but I found the good ones and I, I work with them. You know, from my great uncle, Lord Ernest Rutherford, who, who you know, basically was one of the guys that split the atom, he won the Nobel Prize. And we've got all these people that we can draw on. And I tell my kids these stories because now my children think they're smart. They think they can be things. They think they can achieve and win things. So my son's the national tap champion already at 14 because he believed he came from something. Had I not won anything, had my dad not won anything, had my, my parents and grandparents not done things, he never would have believed he could do that. My daughter wouldn't, wouldn't believe she could make movies. So you tell the stories and everyone, it doesn't have to be a big story. It's a story about coming through adversity and getting out the other end. The winning of the actual goal and the, and the medal or the trophy means nothing. It's how did you overcome? How did you become that person of substance which can, can push and drive and explain that to someone? Because that's the hard stuff. That's what makes a great speaker. You let people into your heart. 
And if you don't think your stories are worthwhile, if you've, you've had tons of criminal activity in your family and things don't work out, find other people of inspiration you can draw on their stories. There's always a way to do something. And that's my whole spiel is there's never, don't look at what you can't do, look at what you can. Find the way you can make it through and search for that. Thank you, Greg. That's huge. Okay. Something for me to really think about and speak to my daughter. Thank you so much. Now, uh, Surin Chin would like to know, how do you handle your failures? Any tips to shift the mindset from you being a dis uh, you know, disappointed over your failures? How do you shift that mindset? Yeah, and look, failure is disappointing. And you can't deny it. People go, oh, yeah, it's lessons. And I do, the lessons are in the losses. You know, the, the, I call it, there's winning and learning, you know, but it hurts, of course it hurts. You know, my, my son's failed so many times. I've failed more times than I can ever imagine to tell you. There's been so many, and some of them have been epically huge and in front of lots and lots of people. And it does hurt, it does knock you down. But you have to go away and work out. This is where writing stuff down in a journal happens. You know, when I, when I lost, my first world shooting titles I went to, my very first shot out of the pistol was a bad one. And I knew from the very first shot, I now could not win. And I had to compete for the rest of the week knowing that I could not win. And that's character building. You keep fighting through to the end and then you see how you went. Did I go well in the three out of the four events? I'll work on that one when I get back. So you have to start being more analytical. So I made a point of looking at myself in the third person. So if you do that, you don't become so personal about it. So if I look at myself and say, well, you know what, what Greg did was this. Greg came up too fast. He shot the first shot without thinking. It was, it was an eight, not a 10. That put him two points behind from the start. He wasn't going to win. So next time, what he should do is this. He should take some time and you, know, and you start working out a plan for next time. All you have to do is keep planning for the next one because there's going to be plenty of times you go through and you won't win. You look at the, the seven out of eight people that don't win the gold medal in the games in the 100 metres. There's, there's seven losers and one winner. Second place is first loser. And that's how it works. But it, and I, I know people that have won Olympic gold medals. And they said to me at the time, one got a bronze. And he said, I much preferred to win the bronze than the silver because I knew that when I won the bronze, I had more to work for. If I'd won the silver, I would have thought I was closer. Uh, maybe it wouldn't have worked so hard to win the gold, but she came back and won twice. So there's a lot to be said in losing and it's character building. But you only actually lose when you stop. If you can keep applying it and keep coming back and understand the fact that it does hurt. It does, it sucks, it is horrible. And I've lost so many big things so many times that when it happens, it absolutely rips the guts out of you. But you know what? That's where the character gets found. When you get knocked down to the floor and you have to fight your way back to your feet. And I say it every time I speak, it's the blood, the sweat, the tears and the years. Because there's so many years involved in coming back to win at a high level. If you want to stay Mr. or Mrs. Amateur down here, that's fine. But if you're aiming high, you're going to have some big falls. The higher you jump, the higher you come down. And you're going to come down hard. And you don't always bounce. Sometimes you take that hit fully and you've got to recover and get over it and get through it and come back. There's always a way back. Sometimes it takes more time than others. But if you have processes in place that if you lose, if you don't make it, you put it down in the third person and then go, right, I'll come back tomorrow and do it again. I'll try, I'll improve on those skills and come back next year. There's always a way to come back. Until you're in the ground, there's another day to do it. And so you keep fighting back. Thank you. The next question is, what do you do when you feel tired, exhausting and things don't seem to be go, uh, you know, working out? People are giving negative remarks at all your efforts. What do you do? Yeah, I know that really well. <laughs> mm -hmm. I used to have people talk about me behind my back, but it was quite loud and I used to hear half of them. And... You have to, the thing I said before is you have to start turning the negativity into fuel. If, if people say, no, you won't make it, and you let that haunt you, you won't make it. If you let them tell you you won't make it, and then go, you watch me when I get there. It's the most amazing thing for me was when it changed. So when I started wanting to be in movies, movies is the most far out stupid thing you can ever want to be in Australia. It's the smallest industry. No one gets through, no one makes it. It's almost unheard of, unless you may be an actor. And I wasn't that good an actor. So me trying to become a film director was a joke. And I had no skills. Like you have to understand when I went into the film industry, I knew no one. I didn't own a camera. I didn't own a computer. I'd never read a screenplay. I knew nothing. And when my friend had his tool stolen, I gave him all of my carpentry tools. I said, I'm going to be a filmmaker. He said, how? I said, I have no idea, but I'm going to make it happen. I didn't know, but I went for it. Everyone laughed at me. Everyone, I, I used to hear the stories or other people would tell me, so I heard this guy saying this about your day, they'll think it's hilarious. But you know what? You just take that in and use it. I used to transfer all of that to energy. 
I really did. I was like a personal Tesla battery and I would take that stuff on board and charge myself up with it and go, you watch me. And guess what? The weird thing was when I started to get there and I started to get notoriety, those people came up to me and said, oh, we knew you'd get there. Man, it's so awesome. If you ever got a film role going, I'd love to have a, have a go in it. It's like, yeah, thank you. You just wipe your hands and walk off. I never forgot. I never forgot those people that did that. But at the same time, had they not done that, I don't know if I would have made it. So this is the flip side of it. If you don't allow those people into your life and utilize it the right way, you may shut yourself off from something, or if you let it haunt you, you're gonna shut yourself down. Take it and learn how to use it. And you will have days where you don't feel like doing it. You will have days where the wheels are spinning. I've had millions of them and they will spin. But keep working on the processes. Keep writing in your journal. Those days will change. That's when I talk about suicide. Suicide's impulsive. You know, the day we put all those anti-suicide barriers up over the bridges, the suicide rate went down 90% overnight because people go, they go, I'm gonna do, oh, I can't do it. I'll come back tomorrow. But tomorrow's another day. It might be better. So. All that impulsive stuff comes and goes. So the next day may be a better day, but as long as you keep true to the processes and no matter how you feel, you keep true to yourself and you keep practicality and diligence and all that stuff going for you in, in the foreground, you get up, you start and you start making a difference. It will spin, you get plenty of days like that, trust me, but keep moving forward. And if you need to listen to speakers, if you need to listen to a soundtrack or something that inspires you, bang it on in the morning and get moving because that stuff kicks you off and then the rest of it takes over. Thanks, Greg. I think uh, I had answered quite a number of questions here that were similar. There's one question from uh, JP. He says, how, he asks, how do we start if we are even not sure of what is the first step towards our goal? Pick something. Don't see, you're already overthinking it. That's the problem. See, I, I have a great thing with people that are smarter than me is they, they, they're so smart, they're stupid. <laughs> they, they put themselves into this space of where they, they find every reason why they can't do it. If you have something you enjoy, start. It may not be the right thing, but it will put you moving and motion builds things. As soon as you start building activity, things start to happen. And it, what it will do though, is when you're on a pathway, it will do this. I talk about bowling. Now, I don't know if in Malaysia you've got those rubber things on the side of the, kid, of the bowling alleys for the kids when they bowl. Okay, that's what it does. It puts those parameters up. You'll bowl the ball, it'll go boom, 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 boom. Eventually, you'll get the strike. It doesn't just happen. You'll start on a path, you'll bounce off that barrier. You go, oh, that wasn't it. Boom, no, that's not it. And you go, boom, that's not it. And eventually, you'll start honing in and you'll get the strike. It, as I said, it takes time. If you go back to my, my bodybuilding was seven years, the World Shooting Championship was eight years, movies were 15 years, speaking was about five years, uh, everything's years. I've accepted the fact now that it's years. So understand that it's gonna be time, but it's a start. Please just start on something that you have an inkling towards and out of that I guarantee it will build momentum and you'll build the skill set, and it'll take you in the right direction as time moves on. Thanks, Greg. Hubert would like to know what has kept you going for over 40 years as a karate master? What is the biggest purpose? To pass it on now. I mean, for me, you know, I, I fought, you know, in different countries, Okinawa and in China and different places when I was younger. And, and I've never been a violent person. I don't like that, but I love understanding how the body moves and how to make it really function. And all of my martial arts is very practical. You know, I'm, all, I've, te I'm, I'm, I've softened over time. I've got the rubber nunchaku here for the young kids, but normally all my kids learn with timber. So if they hit themselves in the head, they know about it. So they build respect for the weapon system. But everything I do is, is done to pass on. So I've gotten to a point now that when I was younger, it would have been for me. Because when I was trying, I wanted to be the best. I wanted to be the best martial artist, the best everything. And that was just my drive to prove myself to myself. But as I've gotten to a point now, I feel I've learned a lot of stuff and I have a, a a piece of me now that's willing to pass it on without the bravado. I think there's, if you do it too young, I think you're still trying to prove yourself and you still got more to achieve. And I think now I'm at a point where I can say, you know what, I've achieved a lot of things and I can also teach these young kids how to build the right mindset and the tenacity so they can actually achieve themselves while still doing my own journey. I still have a great journey I want to do in speaking and to help people and to, to speak more around the world and do all that stuff in the future. I have a huge plan of attack for that. And, and how I can help people grow with my, my programs. But it's all about passing and giving on now because I realized when I had that stroke that if you don't do it for someone, something bigger than yourself and you don't do it to better the planet, the one day when you fall off the perch, you've, you've left nothing worthwhile behind. You know? So I go back to that initial, initial thing I said, what is your legacy gonna be? So when, when you leave this place, what are you leaving behind? You may not have found your path yet, but when you do, 
Start adding value to it and things you can pass on to other people. Because if it stops with you, it's been kind of a pointless journey or it's been a self, you know, the old three finger deal to me journey. And you want to do this, I want to hand it back to other people and help them. Toastmasters helped me dramatically when I was, I joined when we'd lost Fury Road and we were at the lowest point of my life. And I knew that when I got to that point, I was feeling almost suicidal and a friend killed himself on my birthday, that I needed to do something to change. And I spoke to people and I saved some lives. The very next day I joined Toastmasters. They never knew how close I was to the edge. To this day, they don't know. But you know what? Had they not been there, had Toastmasters not been there, maybe I wouldn't be. But I found it and I found speaking and I found a passion to help people and I, and I fell in love with it. And what I learned very early on was if you pour your heart out honestly and don't hold too much stuff back, be really open with people, it'll, it'll resonate in a way that, that changes people and it allows them to change you. And I think that's the joy of it. Thanks, Greg. I've, I have always had this conflict between me. Like, you know, when I go out and do something, I was like, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. I know I'm born for greatness, but I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing kind of thing. And I tend to question myself, like, you know, I, I have so much of talent with my hands, but then I don't know how to actually put it into use to do what I want to do end up I you know I always do what something that I'm forced to do and I tell myself I always compromise with myself saying that you know what this is just to make a living this is for my children and I know it's not a good example because we tell I tell my children you know what follow your heart follow your passion and when you don't practice what you preach you tend you start to actually you know, question yourself, are you actually doing the right thing? In fact, are you a good role model to your children? And it's an, it's an oxymoron. You've already answered your own question. You're not doing the right thing. You know, you're not doing the path you were cho chosen to walk. You were, and you've taken the, the, the work life, money, chicken feeder life for your kids. And it's become an excuse that you're doing it for your kids. And at the same time, if you want to change that, you have to do the same, I suppose, same way I did incrementally. It's, it doesn't just happen. You can't just go, well, I'm, well, actually, I've done this where I've just thrown everything to the wind, sold the house and gone and done something because that's just me. But when I was getting to movies, I was building all day and I was writing movies and making my short films all night till two in the morning. And I'd be back up at five and I'd, I'd go to building again. If it just it takes a lot. And I know it's not the healthiest way to do stuff, but if you really want to affect change, then you have to start applying those changes. And even if you start with two or three hours a night, I mean, you can listen to any top person who's made it in something will tell you the same stories. I mean, it's not just my story, it's a thousand stories. If I've even heard Tony Robbins say it the other day. He was talking to someone about it, said, yeah, this is your job, what's your other eight hour job? You know? So what are you working towards at night? Like, what are you building? If you really want to change something, you have to change something, but it starts here. If you don't start writing that journal stuff down and saying, this is what I'm gonna be, and then start chipping away at it. I mean, that great thing I talk about in carpentry is that you, know, you chip away at stuff and that's what it is. You just keep chipping away and you build piece by piece by piece. And you start out of that, you'll start developing a little market. You know, some people that are interested. You start developing that until it becomes more important than the thing you're doing. And you can push that away and build into this. It doesn't just happen. As I said, it, just in that little story, you've got three years of work. But if you're not prepared to put in the three years of work, and let's go back to the journal, if you aren't prepared to write the paragraph in the journal, then you're not gonna make that happen. It's, it's the smallest bit of commitment, but if you do not wanna do that, then how are you gonna make the other thing happen? You won't. And, and that means you're not committed to it enough. And, you know, and if you don't believe in yourself enough, then you can change that by changing your mindset by writing in your journal. <laughs> it keeps going back to that same thing. It's no mystery to it, but it just takes a level of commitment to change. You know? And have someone to bounce stuff off. If, if find someone who, I have many friends, they call me, they call me the accountability buddy. I, I changed the second word to a B-A-S-T-A-R-D because I, I, I'm more harsh with them. Because I believe that you have to hold each other accountable. So if you have something you want to do, tell someone close to you who's a driven person and they will ring you and go, so Sajada, how's that goal going? Where are you at, why? And they'll hold you accountable. It'll make you push forward. So try and find someone else as an ally to push yourself forward. That's really handy sometimes because in the world of mental health even, it's, it's a big thing when you're on your own, it's a hard battle to fight. But if you can find an ally, which is why I always say that when we do something, when we build it, we do it together, they've got someone they can work with. So if you can find someone to help you, at the same time, validate that you're doing your work, you've got more chance of making it if that's the case at the moment. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Wenka would like to know 
how do you actually deal with critics who condemn you on your single mind mindedness to achieve your goals? At, at that, I do that. See that there? <laughs> That's my care factor, zero. I don't care. I, I got to a point where I don't care what people think. You, you can't care what people think, and especially the detractors. I mean, whilst I was using that stuff as fuel as a younger person, I don't need that anymore. I have, I believe enough in myself now, and this has taken a long time to, to not care. I will tell you honestly when I, when I tell you stuff because I don't believe in sugarcoating it, which is why I don't prepare speeches for this stuff, because I have to tell you what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, and you know, even the Q&A sessions, I would just want to tell you honestly. And if I don't, it's, I'm, I'm lying to you. I can't give you a pre, pre-written thing. It's just wrong. You know, and so you can't worry about that stuff. And it's, it's in the film industry, you call it rhino skin. It's like having that skin of a rhinoceros over your back to shield you. But I just don't care. I stopped caring and it was so good. Such a great feeling when I stopped caring about what anyone else thought and what the detractors thought. And if you're not obsessed by something, you won't make it. It's not, not a passion. Passion's where you start. Obsession's where you finish. I live, if you, on my phone, I have probably a thousand speakers good and bad. I learn as much from the bad speakers as the good ones. When I watch speakers on TV, when I go into different channels and watch different speakers speak, I turn the sound off. I want to see how they move. I want to see the honesty in their eyes. I want to see that natural movement. The trouble I see with a lot of speakers these days is they have this orchestrated movement where they look like they're dancing and it looks wrong. If you don't naturally move, I grew up in Narawina with a lot of Italians. So I speak like an Italian and my hands move a lot. And if you don't naturally do that, don't do it. Be you, always be you. And I think we step away from that. So, I mean, the same way when you're building a career or building something, you have to become obsessed by it. I live, breathe, dream, and it, all of my walls are coated in things. All my achievements live in my office. No one ever gets to see them. The house is dedicated to my kids, all their stuff's everywhere. All their pictures and images and things they want to do and achieve are on the walls because this is their time. My time's in the office. I know what I can do and I don't need to be surrounded by lots of stuff. But at the same time, I don't care what anyone thinks. If you think the world of me, that's great. If you think the worst of me, that's great too. I don't care. Because if I worry about that, it detracts on what I'm trying to work on. And so why should I let that derail me? If, if what I do saves one life or what I do helps one person achieve, if I speak to 20,000 people and one person gets a benefit, it was worth the speech. And if we stop worrying about all these detractors and negativity, I mean, that's the worst thing with social media. It's in this Moore's Law we talk about where we, ha we can have relationships with 150 people. Suddenly, we've got this thing here which we can get trolls and people from all over the world can, can have an opinion on us. If you look at my YouTube channel, every single comment thread is turned off. I don't care what anyone thinks. I really don't care. I want to help people. And if, it, if what I put up helps people, that's wonderful. If people don't like it, watch something else. But you can't spend your life worrying about this stuff because it just takes away from your energy. It, it makes you feel down. I learned that really quickly because I used to get detractors saying all kinds of stuff. And I thought, you know what, what if I just turn it off? <laughs> that's cool, it works. And you still get the message out there and the people that love what you do still love what you do. And that's, at the end of the day, that's what matters. And, and if you've got stuff to work on, well, you take it to the people you respect and you, you have at your side and they'll tell you honestly, you know, if they're good friends, they'll say, you know what, you need to work on this. And then you go and work on it. It's, it's really simple. People worry about too many other things. Just work on you, be, better, better you. Thank you, Greg. It has been such an in, insightful moment. I guess the key to starting off is keeping a journal. Keeping a it is the simplest, cheapest, and most rewarding thing you will ever do. It really is. And there's, you know, I think, the, and it changes your way of thinking to success, to fulfillment. I think you have to be fulfilled. You know, success to me is always tied to money. And I think we need to get away from that and find out what makes us smile when we sit up in bed in the morning, you know, and what could we work towards if we could. And just understanding there's no easy road. It will take time. It will be negative. There will be all that stuff. It's not just going to be this journey. And I think this is one of the problems these days with the education system. We don't tell the kids this stuff. They'll walk out, go, oh, we'll get a job and get a career. No, you won't. You're going to get told no a lot. Get used to it. But keep working. And you eventually get the yes. And you'll eventually make the career. And that's how you make it. There's no easy road. And unfortunately, we're, we're arming all these young people up for failure because we're not showing them how to deal with failure. And just remember, the first step is just a step. It's a step in a very long staircase. And sometimes the things slip down flat and you're going to slide back to the bottom and start again. But guess what? You'll go back smarter. And if you're prepared to do that, then you'll, you'll always come back. You, you will always learn more. You'll develop a, a more of a rhino skin. You, you'll benefit. And, and my biggest thing, if you have no clear idea on what to go for as a goal, I'll offer you this one piece of advice, which I think is the most important. Go towards what you're scared of.
Go towards your greatest fear and inside that lies your greatest assets and your greatest skills in waiting. And all they're doing is waiting for you to get courageous enough to go towards them. Because as I said, everything I'm known for now as an adult was my greatest fear as a kid because you overcompensate and you become ultra strong in those areas. And if you do that, you're on a path to something great and then you can leave a legacy, which is going to be awesome. Thank you, Greg. I believe everyone here has benefited so much from your sharing and I take it so personally. Once again, thank you so much for, for being here and for answering all these questions that uh, had been posted by the audience and even by myself. Uh, we're going to move on. Oh, I have another question. Uh, let's, let's do this last one. Um, how simple is your life? <laughs> Yen Fung wants to know how simple is your life? My life is really complex. However, <laughs> I love it. So when I'm writing things and doing, um, I get about three to four hours sleep a night on average. And, but I delegate my time really carefully. You know, I, I always have time for Toastmasters. It's just, you guys mean the world to me. My, my kids get my time. My, the people I help get my time. My students get my time. I really, because you remember time's your asset. You don't get that back. If you give it to someone, make sure it's for the right reason and for the right people. And my life's as complex as I want to make it. You know, I can make it simpler, but I'd lose some of the joy. So I, I really love doing what I do. I love speaking. I love teaching martial arts. I love helping people. I love the Speakers Academy. I love building the programs. All the stuff we're doing, I, I really enjoy it. And it's, but it's taken a long time to get to that point and a lot of career paths. You know, but had I not done all those career paths, I wouldn't have had the experience to take me to this, what I do now. And, you know, and we're still building this. It's all, it's all baby steps, you know, it, and it's never over. You know, you, you, that chapter closes, you build that next chapter, but all those things are still you. If you've done lots of things in your life, you, you don't say, I used to be that. You're still that. You've been all that. That's fantastic. Take it with you to the next stuff. Take all those skill sets and all that stuff you did and use it. And all the hard times, write them down and keep them and go, you know what? I've been through all of this and I'm still here. Look at this, I've got what it takes and I can make it. That's all that stuff that makes you work. And I love my life, I love what I do, I really do. And if more people could step away a little bit from their nine to five or eight to four or whatever hours they do and put a piece of time aside, not just for your family, but for you. Turn your phone off, start getting creative, start putting your plan down, start putting your journal in place. And bit by, even if it's 20 minutes a day, start working towards something, build it up slowly. If you've got ideas, don't have 400 ideas, have one and just start working on one and then build it up as your strength and, and energy comes up. Start building on two, then three, then four. Don't write a list of 600 things which you'll never achieve and become disappointed. Start with one thing and work towards that. It's, it's really simple stuff. We, as human beings, we like to overcomplicate and in doing that, we diminish our capacity. And I think if more of us just kept very simple in our, in our thinking process and just turn your phone off and think about your goal in silence, or think about what you'd love to do in silence and don't make it about work. Just say, if I could do one thing, and it might not end up being the thing, but it'll get you closer to the thing that makes the difference. If you can do that, then you're gonna change your life and it'll feel fantastic. Because once you start on the path, you already feel better because now you're working towards something you actually love. And then this thing becomes a, a, something that funds this. And then this thing gets more energy and then this becomes more of this and suddenly you've got a career. And that's how the process works. You know, if anyone's got questions, please, Get on my website, email me. I, I, I don't take money for anything. Just my email address is, I think it's, I've got two now, but the main one is greg at gvbmindwarriors.com.au or, or just gvbmindwarriors at gmail.com. Either one and, and flick me some questions. I'm always happy to answer them and you know, see what I can do to help you. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you for sharing your experience, your knowledge and impacting everyone here today, especially myself. Uh, it has been great. I, one thing that I'm going to take back to me, uh, with me is that one is journaling and second is passion through pragmatism. That's going to push me. And you have been a booster for me and I'm going to keep that going. Thank you so much, Greg. And, and feel uh, free to keep in touch, please. I'm, I, I don't, you know, if you need an accountability buddy and you don't have one, just bounce some emails to me and messages on Zoom or, or um, WhatsApp and I'll, Keep you in check. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that offer. I would definitely take it up, Greg. <laughs> Pleasure. Because, yeah, I want to uh, really, Toastmasters has been a huge thing for me. And if I can see more Toastmasters make it to where they want to be, 
because I think a lot of people tick the box and get the badge with a little thing on it and they move on, they don't apply the skills. Toastmasters inside itself has all the skill sets and steps to make you a wonderful leader if you learn how to apply it to your life. And a lot of people don't apply it. They just do the tick the box, get the ACB or A, you know, and they move on. It's like if you took that and actually utilized it, you'd have a great leader in front of you. And that's where I think we're letting ourselves down a lot of the time. We just want to say we've done all these things and achievements come and go. It's what you take with you that makes the difference. Fantastic. So thank you so much. District 102 loves you. I love you so much. I wish thank you, you all everyone. the best. It's been a pleasure. And back to you, Toastmaster of the day. Keep it. Thank you, Gray, and also Sujata for such a wonderful session. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's one thing that you can do to make a difference, what would you do? So right now, I would like to ask all of you to turn on your camera and let's take a group photo so that you will remember this session and start moving towards your goal. Okay, Jacob, please uh, cue us when everyone has the camera on. Okay. Uh, everyone, kindly turn on your cameras. Okay. We will be starting the photo shooting in 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, four, three, two, and one. Okay, let's take a picture. Give your biggest smile. One, two, and three. Okay, another one. One, two, and three. Let's have a candid shot, okay? Uh, let's have a candid one. Okay, one, two, and three. Okay, that's it. Maybe we can give some love to Greg. Yeah, yeah. That, that heart <laughs> reaction button. Okay. One, two, and three. Okay. Okay, that's it uh, for the photo shooting session. Back to you. Thank you, Jacob, our Zoom master. Now, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Gilbert and I'm from the annual conference marketing team. Now today we have a special referral promotion for all of you here. For every successful referral that you, that you successfully get them to register and paid for our physical annual conference, you will get an RM5 ringgit rebate for your ticket and you will get one additional entry to the lucky draw. For our lucky draw, we are having exciting prizes such as a speaker that can also function as a wireless speaker that can fun also function as a clock and a radio. And also we have like Fitbits uh, and also some massage vouchers and many more exciting prizes. And for our annual conference, it is once again, it is on the 27th to 29th for the physical event at Emerald Resort Hotel Desaru Johor. I will leave my contact here at the Zoom chat so that if you have any questions regarding the annual conference, you can feel free to ping me. And with this, I will now pass the stage to our big man of the District 102, our District Director, Distinguished Toastmaster Sri Nivas for his closing address. Over to you, Sri. Thank you so much, Cuba. Thank you so much, Greg, for being here. We have loved you last year. We love you this time. And we are truly inspired and great. I love the kind of energy you bring, the stories. It's so authentic and so genuine that I believe, not just me, but most of us, when we look at you and we're like, done? 40 minutes? Where did it go? It's, it's there. It's like, okay, that was a lot. And then we look at it, wow, that was a lot of golden nuggets. That was a lot of information. And more than that, I thought that's the inspiration we needed. And thank you so much. I think your life speaks much more louder than your speech because the things you share, what you've gone through in your life. And sometimes I think that when we talk about challenges and all, and as you keep telling things, your childhood and your film ministry and different stages, I'm like, okay, our lives are quite better, actually. We, we have not been to that extra. We're still good. We're still good. So that is itself is an inspiration. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, we truly appreciate you as District 102. And we always will. We really look forward to see you in person one day. I know we, we were expecting you, Kishan communicated. We were really hoping to see you in person. But current situation of pandemics and all those things have created all those issues. But we really love to see you maybe next year or another time 
in person in district one we look forward for that so thank you so much for being part of our online and our first speaker as usual i can see the comments in the in the chat box people love you so thank you so much for inspiring and helping us see from a different mindset and helping us to uh, make decisions make decisions and i love two things what you said which i even mentioned that <laughs> simple just start yeah. that's it just start and this one <laughs> that's what you think i said oh, that's what you think about this one i think that's that's the two things which uh, inspired me and many other of uh, us as well so thank you so much so ladies and gentlemen of district 102 we do have and thank you so much for having a conference chair with kishan and the team for organizing the entire thing and all the role players in this meeting thank you so much for joining look at the link in the chat box do sign up for the future sessions as well online and those who are in malaysia if you can come to the saru that would be great to see you in person as well and by this back to you mr jos master thank you distinguished direct sorry distinguished host master sri nivas our district director with this uh, this session comes to an end and for our next session we it will be on next saturday uh, it's going to be a Mandarin session by Sherry Sue. And then on the Sunday, we have two more other speakers for the English session. So for more information, feel free to, to text, uh, to, read, to check the chat box here. I believe there's a registration link uh, as well as the link for you to find out more about the annual conference. And with this, this uh, I'll call this session to an end. Thanks everyone for joining and you can stay back for chit chat and yeah, and mingle around. Thank you.